So before starting, I want to tell you a story. When I was a kid, in my middle school, we had an amazing teacher. His name was Mr. Ahmed al the teapot. He considered himself as a teapot because he believed that he was the source of information and the source of knowledge. And we were empty, innocent glasses, just, just ready for the moment we can swallow anything he dictates. Actually, we had a great time with Mr. Ahmed because we really enjoyed when watching him sitting on his desk, swaying from side to side, recounting his lovely lessons and stories. That was in the 1980s. And the same thing he used to when he was a teacher in the 1970s and also 60s. But what is surprising is, teachers now in the 21st century are still teaching the same way my friend did early in the past. Despite the implementation of technology, I believe there is no difference between this picture and this one. So both the classes look like teacher-based classes or teacher-centered classes, or let's say knowledge-based classes. So do you believe that students in the 21st century need knowledge-based class or skill-based classes? Last month, in my school, we had a lesson about, uh, about the world in the fourth industrial revolution. And I asked my students, is there anyone who is a fighter with the uh, Amazon Go? And I saw a lot of hands up. I said, please, I'm not speaking about Amazon that you know. I'm speaking about Amazon Go, the big store that appeared in the States in 2008 in January. And I saw the hands still up. So I asked one of the students, he's a kid, age 12, I asked him, hey man, what do you know about Amazon Go? He said things that I didn't know. So do you believe that this student, like many other students at his, at his age, needs someone to pour the information to their minds? I believe the answer is no. Those students need more skills. I totally agree with the Jack Norman he said. The things we teach our children are things from the past 200 years. It is knowledge based. And we cannot teach our kids to compete with the machines just because the machines are smarter. And I also agree with Barbara Christian when she said students need 21st century skills to meaningfully participate in our digital world rather than being steamrolled by it. Unfortunately, the way we are teaching the students, we are not helping them integrate the 21st century. They are and they will be steamrolled and just look and think about the number on the margin of the digital world. The question, is it due to the lack of knowledge or because of the lack of skills? Again, I believe the problem is more about skills, it's not about knowledge. But we have to consider some statistics. For example, in the States, almost 40% of American employers complain and say they cannot find the people with the skills they need. This is USA, and we see the number. In the coming years, we have 47% of jobs maybe are automatic away. And it is estimated that 65% of children entering primary school today will ultimately end up working in job types that do not yet exist. Nevertheless, we should be optimistic because there are a lot of approaches and methodologies that really paved the way for a better and brighter future. And one of these methodologies is a flipped learning. It remains as one of the most successful methodologies, because apart from promoting a new vision to teach in different subjects, it focuses on building leadership and socio-emotional skills. 
So when, maybe one is going to ask me, what is, what is special with this flip curve? Especially I asked the question at the beginning, and this, I said, who is better? And then you see, I see any hand up. So now maybe someone will say, what is, what is this flip curve? Flip learning actually is totally different from the conventional methodologies that are adopted nowadays in many countries. Knowing that this methodology appeared in states in 2007, and now it is adopted in 49 countries. So we hope we're going to have more people adopting this methodology. So uh, the differences are so many, but I'm going to focus on two. The first one is the space use, and the second is the class time to use. So flipped learning has redefined the space use and has given a new dimension to the class time use to boost creative learning. Starting with the space, and here I'm going to start first with the individual space. That can be home, that can be library, and there will be no baths. So the home is no more that place where the students complete a number of exercises called homework, which represents frustration and monotony for both the parents and their kids and even for the teachers. The home is a place where the students complete a number of cognitive skill building activities and they get ready for the upcoming non-cognitive ones that are going to take place out in class. The class becomes a large workshop where the students are freely and in friendly atmosphere. They can walk, they can talk, they can discuss, they can share, they can do plenty of activities together. And they are like a bee, so practicing analyzing, evaluating, interpreting, experimenting, innovating, and promoting their products. The class time takes the value it deserves. The students feel the amount of time they are actively engaged in learning. And the teachers cover a number of skills using different you know, different uh, activities uh, through different strategies that can start with interaction, critical thinking, going through communication and ending up with innovation and product promotion. I have been flipping my lessons since 2013-2014 and since then I have clear-cut revolutionized my way of teaching. I feel that my class has become more interactive and more engaging. And my students, through the different stages of the lesson, show that sense of leadership that has always been my priority. So after covering or adopting the core concept of flipped learning and variety of activities ranging from receptive to productive, we have decided to embark on a new adventure called Flipping Movies for better in-class engagement and community empowerment. So before going into the details, maybe we're going to ask a question. How do we select films? Actually, each unit we are dealing with goes around a very selected film, which is chosen according to its culture content as well as its widely accepted themes. Every film should include a moral that should be well exploited so that we can help the students build their ability to make good judgments and also to reflect on different perspectives and also develop their ways of thinking to prepare them as the future leaders. So our lessons involve five phases with the stages and with very determined goals. First, we have the pre-movie class, or we call it the preparatory stage. And then we have the movie day, or we call it the party-like day, because it's gonna be like a party in school. Then after we go to the out-of-class activities, or we call it the instruction day. And it is very similar to what we, we do in conventional classes when we prepare the students for you know, becoming stages. And then the students go to class, so where we have what we call the in-class activities. And as you see, we have promotion. 
So the last phase, and I want you to consider it because it's one of our greatest priorities, is the post-class activities. Since we take the students from what we call thinking out of the box to acting beyond and out of the walls. So I'm going to try to develop each single uh, phase and stage with some examples. Starting with the pre-movie classes, our preparatory stage. So the students uh, via documentaries or songs complete a number of activities before watching the film. This is a very similar to pre-teaching vocabulary. So for example, before watching the film Gifted Hands, the students had a documentary about Ben Carson's experience and a song entitled Superheroes. So both materials, the documentary and the song, made in some points. First, fostering the student's motivation to set lofty goals. And second, to be ready to challenge and to face every sig single obstacle they face in their daily lives. And number three, enjoy success and keep their dreams alive. So then, uh, or sorry, before we, uh, continuing, we go to the regression. So when we give the students what we call the background knowledge, for sure we're gonna increase their motivation when we are dealing with the film. And also we encourage a more focused viewing of the film. The students are gonna be more interested when the film is gonna start, when they're gonna watch the film. This results in a greater simulation of the material, that's great, and also we promote a stronger subsequent analysis, which is one of our priorities, I said at the very beginning, because we target more the skills than the knowledge. So after, uh, the pre uh, after the first stage, we go to the party like day or the movie like uh, or the movie day, because we try to uh, create a movie theater like atmosphere in our classes, in darkened classrooms with a large TV set, sometimes using the data show. The students sit in rows. They can eat their popcorns. They can drink whatever they they they, they bring, and no taking is not obligatory because they're gonna have some work to do out of class, so they don't need to take any notes. It's more about fun. So after completing the fun time, we go to the out of class activities where the serious time class stopped. We also call it the instruction day. This is the last film I dealt with. It's about minimalism. It's a documentary about the important things that people can keep in their, in their homes. So the out of class activities last most of the time 20 to 45 minutes. But when we have advanced classes, sometimes it can last for one hour to one hour 15 minutes. And it covers a lot of questions. The first question is the visual intelligence. We do believe that our students nowadays don't pay much attention to the smallest details. Why the small details make a difference? So every activity starts with visual intelligence. They have the posters, they have cartoons, they have pictures to interpret, to describe, and sometimes to connect ideas related to content. For instance, this is an example of the last uh, visual intelligence activity I had with my students. So this is a program written by a student. If you can have like 30 seconds to just to have a look. Okay, it's about, uh, the, the lesson is about minimalism, it's about lifestyles. And this is the picture I suggested is about the mass media. And this is a program written by a student and it is incorrect. And this is a, a rubric that uh, we use in class for peer-to-peer -peer assessment. This we use it especially in classes so that the students can evaluate their peers' work. And as you see, the criteria that we focus more, uh, number one is creative fluency create flexibility, then we go to connection between description and interpretation. And then we have program organization, then we go to language mastery, vocabulary, and grammar use. And this work is done by the students in class. So after the visual intelligence, we have another question related to language. So this, we try to focus more on vocabulary and pronunciation. 
then we go to listen and reading comprehension, and we know that listening and reading comprehension represents some of the greatest challenges for EFL students. Maybe you, see, you feel that when they take like the TOEFL. Number four, we have writing a summary. The summary is very easy because all what they have to do is they collect all the comprehension answers and they connect them accurately. Fifth point is preparing two smart questions. Every weekend, the students are asked to prepare two questions related to the out-of-class activities. I insist on that because I believe that teaching our students to think correctly and to, to work on the right questions for the right one of the priorities in every single class. The primary objectives are when the students complete the out-of-class activities, and when they are in class, they, the first thing that you are, we are going to see is that demonstration of their linguistic proficiency. We see the students when they are in class so, and so, so excited and so motivated to show what they have been. And the second thing they try to demonstrate is their cognitive development. As I said at the very beginning, what is about cognitive is takes a place out of class. So we keep the classes for more non-cognitive skill uh, activities. Uh, before moving to in-class activities, I want to highlight a very interesting point, the types of questions. Unlike the homework or any kind of exercises, the out-of-class activities, the questions should be very different. Because we are not assessing at this stage. We are helping the students to understand the lesson content. So the questions are most of the time ranging from easy to what is a little bit challenging and also from global to what is specific. That's a very interesting point because many times we see teachers when they flip their lessons, uh, the students find a lot of problems. It's like homework. Actually, it's not homework. It has nothing to do with the homework. Okay, so when the students are in class, the first most popular activity is called the SHAP. It stands for share, help, ask, and comment. So in 20 minutes, the students stand in class, and this is one of the pictures of uh, how the shack is conducted. So first in groups of five, then groups of four, then groups of three, they try to share whatever they have done out of class. At the same time, they help their peers, those maybe who have struggled, or maybe they couldn't understand the question, or maybe they misunderstood anything, so this is the right moment, everything is a share. Me, I always call it the cafe talk because it's a free talk and I also ask them to speak also about, you know, uh, the questions, if they like the questions or no, if they face any problem when, either when answering. And also the students who do not complete the out-of-class activities, maybe are going to share with their partners, this is the reason I didn't do my work. And the others are going to try to help. And then we go to ask and comment this kind of uh, basic assessment, so they are in pairs and they try to ask each other <coughs> questions related to, to the out-of-class activity. So it's another chance for the students okay, to assimilate what they have been doing out-of-class. This is a great time of engagement and exploring their thoughts and their reaction. So what is the rationale of the shack time? Practicing the language. The students are going to use and reuse the target vocabulary. Just imagine 20 minutes you are standing and using and reusing. You did the summary of the class, everything is in your mind. Sometimes you can have, you know, your cat book or whatever, and you are sharing what you have been doing. So, so the target vocabulary is used and reused. That's number one. Number two is developing the fluency and the spontaneous interaction. Especially when we are dealing with the non-natives. So we want students to speak like natives. So these help them. Okay, when speaking to their peers and changing in the, in the free atmosphere, they're going to build that skill of spontaneous interaction. And number three is building the sense of cooperative learning. Knowing that more than 80% of jobs nowadays are based on teamwork. So we help our kids to build this, this skill or this sense of learning, cooperative learning again at an early age. And finally, Boosting three basic leadership skills. First, collaboration. Second, communication. And third, critical thinking. It's a basic stage of critical thinking because we're going to come to higher developed stages of critical thinking.
So after it completed the shack time, as I said, it takes like 20 minutes to 25 minutes, it depends. We go to the smart question. I believe you remember when I said the students must prepare two smart questions. Me, at this stage, when I'm, I'm, I'm checking the answers, I pick the best smart questions. Most of the time, at the beginning of this school year, I find it hard to find very good questions. Most of the time, they are very similar. But in one, two months, things have changed, and it becomes harder for me to select the best questions. What is the rationale of these? The students, when asking each other, they keep standing and they keep speaking spontaneously for a longer time. And secondly, they learn how to ask the right questions. And finally, deepening the students' thinking and going to the second stage of critical thinking. So maybe some are going to ask, what about the teacher? I feel that maybe you didn't notice any teacher's role. Our role is just in time feedback by listening and guiding students and making notes on their language use. After completing this, we go to the creative learning. If you remember, the first activity or the first stage was a shack time. Second stage, what was it? Smart questions. And now we go a little bit higher. It's a creative learning. I call it also you learning because it's going to take a U form. The beginning, so students have what we call the critical thinking stage. They give their opinions, they discuss whatever related to the film content, shots, scenes, themes, whatever. And gradually, I insist on the word gradually, we take them to the creative thinking. We try to help them build their way of thinking, how? Through the following activities. The first one is called creative fluency. It's a very similar to brainstorming. The students try to create, to generate the greatest number of ideas in a very limited time. And then they go to creative flexibility. Creative flexibility, what they have to do is all the quantity of words or ideas that they have come up with, they try to organize and categorize them. And then when we go to problem-finding, problem-solving situations, it's about originality. They have to come with some original ideas. At this stage, the students need some help, need some support. I'm not helping, I'm not supporting. I give them the right to use their IT. So they use their phones and computers in order to try to find some, uh, there are some arguments, facts, statistics in order to elaborate their idea, their original idea. And this is the complete work. I'm sorry, I'm not going to call it a work. In all classes, we call it a product because it's something that the students produce. And this product should be promoted, should be presented, should not be kept in the capital. So what we do, we promote this product, public speaking. Second, whole class public speaking. Third, roundtable discussions. Fourth, debates, basic debate, and also fluent debate. And what may surprise you is conferencing. So most of the time we connect our students with international students, especially from uh, states, from Virginia, and Ohio, and many other schools. We connect them, so they watch the same talks, and they try to discuss it together. Or we invite some speakers, and the last speaker we had was Mr. Amin. He is uh, an IT engineer, he works for Google. When we were speaking about the world in the fourth industrial revolution, he was invited and he spoke about Google, how it's working, and all the details that students need at that moment. Okay, now we go to the last phase, which is a post-class activity. We also call it culture activities in the public, CAP. We take the students from thinking out of the box to acting out and beyond the walls. The students are supposed to be engaged in some cultural and uh, social activities. This is the best way to assess their mastery of the lesson objectives, which balance language learning and leadership skill building. 
For instance, after finishing, after completing the film Little Red Wagon, the students were engaged in an activity called No Child Left Behind. This is a non activity. We have been doing this for six or seven years. So they start with a big sale activity. They collect donations. They buy clothes, boots, shoes for more than 400 students studying in four primary schools. After completing this film, Coach Carter, two months ago, we had a campaign called Sports is More Than a Game in which some students visited a lot of classes and spoke to a lot of students about the other benefits of sports, including respect, caring about the others, and also the teamwork. And maybe what should surprise us is the parents' participation. Most of the time in the conventional schools, we have what we call the extracurricular activity. What we are doing is a part of the lesson, each unit, Parents are involved because we, we, we have tried to convince them that their role is not limited just to help their kids to do their homework. What is the priority of this age? Is the skills, helping them, building their leadership skills so the parents are conscious of their role now. So they are physically, emotionally and intellectually involved in different activities that students do, um, I mean the, uh, the community service activities. And also the second that has another benefit is dispelling any kind of illusions. Most of the parents believe their kids are heroes. Oh, you know, my kids, they get best marks, but this is the situation that shows their true colors. Do you know really your kid? Do you know really his competences, his potential? This is the moment they can, they can do that. Also, the kid and parent engagement is a fun. Just, you see, when you are with your kids and uh, working like in volunteer work, how great it is and how proud the kids feel at that moment when seeing their parents involved. Before completing, I wanted to share with you an, uh, a survey I conducted last summer. Uh, I interviewed 65 families to know their opinions about flipping films or very in class engagement and community empowerment. 91% of them confirmed that their kids become more interested in community service. And they said that their kids become better speaker and more interested in people's problems and environmental issues. Yes, thank you. And 70% of the parents confirmed their personal participation from the service. Just when you see this number, parents, 70% of parents, feel that they have to be involved with their kids. And 95% of them assert that they highly motivate their kids to be more engaged. To conclude, Flipping Movies has offered precious time to think how to turn the in-class words into meaningful actions in the larger society. And thank you very much.